We're glad you could join us tonight. My name is Dr. Nicole Feeney, and I'm here both as a physician at Grand River um, and as the community liaison, also as a board member of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And we're really excited to talk to you guys tonight about the meningitis vaccines um, and how much we can be doing for our kids in the community. So just to get started here, I want to introduce my very special guest who has traveled back to the Western Slope. Um, this is Mr. Nate Landon. He is going to share his personal story with us um, about his experience with meningitis. But before we do that, let's lay a little foundation so we're all starting on the same page. Meningitis is a word that's pretty scary to the community. A lot of us have an idea about what it is and what it might look like, um, but we don't really know it well. Um, so I'm hoping to give you a little background so that we can fill in some of those knowledge gaps. So first, let's talk about the disease. This is a bacterial illness. So bacteria are very different from viruses in that bacteria are the ones that we want to treat with antibiotics more likely than not with a, a life-threatening illness or a serious illness. Um, it's most commonly bacterial illnesses that play the role. There are a lot of different kinds of Neisseria meningitis or the virus, I'm sorry, the bacteria that causes this infection. There are a few strains that are the most important to us here in the United States. Those are A, B, C, so you get to practice your alphabet. Can you say that? Come a, B, C, B, C, Y, N, W, okay? That, that's important later on, so that's why I want to emphasize that, all right? All right, so this organism can live in your nose and mouth. And in fact, 10% of people have it in their nose and mouth, just kind of carrying it along with them. All right, so no quit picking your boogers. No, no rowing boogers on each other there in the audience. Um, you know, those people are carriers. They don't have any disease. We don't understand exactly why a small percentage of them will go on to get invasive disease. But 10% is a pretty high number. Of all the people in the population, who's that 10%? That 10% is like these lovely teenagers here on the front row and our young adults. And so that's why they're more at risk and that's why we actually focus in on them for vaccines. Um, being sick shortly before you get exposed to this can actually create another risk factor. When you get exposed, it takes a little bit of time. So we become human incubators. My daughter has chickens. She wants an incubator for her chickens. Our human bodies can incubate diseases just like this and kind of allow them to grow until they become a problem. <laughs> she's here in the audience today, so now she's really embarrassed. Um, average incubation time is three to four days before we start to so show symptoms. The symptoms can come on abruptly and quickly. That's one of the things that's really scary for parents. When I have parents who bring somebody into the emergency room, especially their child with a fever, headache, neck pain, uh, light sensitivity, um, it's a really scary experience, but we do have to worry about meningitis. People can go from really mild symptoms, maybe just not feeling great and kind of flu-like over the course of just a few hours or 24 hours to having a life-threatening illness. The fatality rate with this, with meningitis or the brain infection, is about 10 to 15 percent. For those who actually get it all through their blood and their body, it can be as high as 40 percent. And that's even if we treat them aggressively with antibiotics. All right, so meningi uh, meningococcal meningitis is the most severe presentation. Again, that's the fever, headache, and neck stiffness. Meningococcal sepsis is when the same bacteria gets into the bloodstream and can spread to your organs and cause your organs to shut down. Meningococcal sepsis can cause a, a nice polka dotted uh, purpley rash all over the body. It's real noticeable um, when you touch it. Most childhood rashes will blanch um, and turn white where you touch them. This rash stays purple. It doesn't go away. We call that the blanch test. Anytime you don't pass the blanch test, that is a more concerning rash. You wanna see your pediatrician, you wanna to go to the ER, those are the ones you wanna get checked out right away. Um, other findings can include low blood pressure, shock or sepsis, which we hear a lot about these days, um, going on to even causing some of our organs to bleed or to shut down entirely. This is an example of a non-blanching rash. 
these pictures are, are pretty impressive, but I think it's important for all of us to have an idea about how serious this can be. Nate's gonna talk a little bit about his own personal journey, um, and this gives you kind of a, a reference to understand some of the symptoms that he's gonna describe. But you can see here a small baby's hand with the nails that have actually turned black and, and his hand is purple, more like a bruise. These are, are blood vessels that are kind of weeping into the skin. Here's another example of the rash that can go along with meningococcal disease. There are some things that make us more at risk. All right, so who do we wanna focus on? Obviously, if your immune system doesn't work quite right, or if you don't have a spleen to filter out infection, you're at risk. Um, those are the types of infections that doctors monitor for. I saw a patient today that's gonna actually have a hearing implant um, because he's got hearing loss and we will actually pre-treat him for uh, the same meningitis because having a foreign body that connects to his brain puts him more at risk, okay? Environmental factors. This is the one we wanna talk about because this is where we feel like we can make the most uh, impact in our kids' lives in a day-to-day -day basis, all right? So anywhere where there are a lot of people living together, all right? Um, a lot of people live together in college dorms. A lot of people live together in the military. Um, so again, that young teenage, young adulthood where they're all kind of living together in that tight environment is a really good place for that five to 10% of people who carry it in their nose to spread it to somebody else. And then they end up with a serious infection. Smoking is also a, a risk factor. So when they originally looked at this in the college studies, they didn't show any risk factor in the early 90s. But then they went back and said, what about first year freshmen living in the dorms? And then they started to see a significant amount of people um, or little spikes um, and outbreaks in that age group. All right, you can tell here on this graph, you can see how starting at about 11, 13 years of age, you start to trickle up on the incidence, and then you have kind of this larger peak in that late teens and early 20s. And these are the age groups that we are trying to hit with the booster. Um, we'll talk about the kinds of vaccines that we give at these different age groups here in a minute. Outbreaks only account for a small report of the outbreaks. However, as you can see, they don't spare any geographical area of the United States. These are college campuses where in theory, you can have large numbers of people exposed and even some deaths. So what do we wanna do about this? We would like to actually keep it from happening at all. I'm, I'm very happy to breathe, have, have you come to the emergency room here at Grand River and have to assess you and take care of you and do your spinal tap and do your workup and give you the antibiotics and treat you uh, to the absolute best that science has to offer. It would be nice if we don't have to do that to begin with. My children who in particular don't like needles would very much pale at the sight of a large spinal needle that has to go into your back to draw the fluid off to check for meningitis. Much less as a parent would I wanna be the one sitting there at their bedside worrying about them knowing that there are a number of these kids that get treated and we still can't save them. All right, so we start as pediatricians by offering vaccines. You've got two different vaccines. Why do you have two? Well, we have worked to develop vaccines as quickly as we can for this deadly illness. It progresses rapidly. It's often in the age group where the kids aren't living at home and may not have as much supervision. It has a high mortality rate. The first vaccine that we were able to develop had four of those ABCs that we just talked about. But how many of them were there? There were five, okay? So those vaccines that targeted um, A, C, Y, and W, and Y left out the letter B. The letter B in particular was a much harder bug to get a good vaccine for. And that vaccine came out later. So right now we have a vaccine for B, and then we have another vaccine for the other four letters, okay? The first meningitis vaccines that we give are usually Menatra or Menbeo. We offer those between 10 and 12. And then again, at 17, 16 to 18 years old, we wanna head off that peak. And then the B, we give at 16 and we repeat it in a month. 
Ooh, I just got a really dirty look from my child who hasn't had her second dose. Oh no. Um, the reactions from these vaccines are your typical shot reactions, okay? It's a little local irritation um, at the site. It's pain where we gave the shot, which is common. A little redness, or swelling. Those are the same. Um, generally, sometimes you get that excellent immune system response and you get kind of the total body headache and fatigue. And it's about the same for both vaccines. All right, I've attached some additional resources for those of you who are interested. But the true star of the show tonight here with us is Nate Landon. And I would really like for all of you to hear about his experience with meningitis so you can understand from a very personal um, and emotional um, note how important it is to vaccinate. Thank you very much. And we'll turn this over to Nate. All right, Nate, thank you for joining us. Thank you, guys. All right, so if you don't mind, if you would share with our audience here in the Grand River community, what you went through. Tell us, um, tell us about your experience. Sure. So when I was 24 years old, um, almost 25, and in 2005, I contracted meningococcal septicemia with complications from disseminated intervascular coagulation. That's a lot of a lot of jargon, a lot of words that she can explain better than I can. But basically, my experience um, with this. It was a long and painful and scary experience, not just for me, but for my family and for my friends. And it continues to this day, 17 years later. Um, I was in college at the time, and I was um, on a school trip when it manifested. I'd been traveling for about two weeks, uh, first down to Moab, not too far from here, on a school trip at the University of Utah. Um, where we went on a hiking trip. That first night in town, it's doing what it's kind of doing right now. It was raining, dumping, or dumping just tons of water on us, and nobody wanted to be sitting out in the tent. So we went into town, which just happened to be the same weekend as the Jeep Safari weekend in Moab. So everything was crappy. Everybody's coughing and sneezing. And I'll never really know, because we can't really tell whoever did us the meningitis. We'll never know. You never know who's carrying it. Um, so the best that I could tell from the timeline, from when, I, when it showed up, from the time, or from when I had been traveling, is that I likely caught it while I was in Moab, just due to the amount of people that were there. But I had a nice hiking trip there. I was feeling great for about a week. I went to Washington, D.C. for another school trip the following week. Um, also, lots of students from other countries there. We were there for a competition to bring home a national championship to our school, which we did. But with so many students milling around, there was a good chance that I could have caught it there just off the timeline. Um, but I was the only person who manifested it. Um, I also wandered around Washington, D.C. and then went dancing that night before I went or took a flight home back, back to Utah. But that flight never got me home. On my live, or when I woke up that morning, I was feeling really cold and shaky. And um, I just thought it was because I had slept on the airport floor because I was 24 years old, didn't want to get a hotel room. It was only going to be five hours between the time I got to the airport and my flight. So I napped on the floor. Woke up about six in the morning, feeling very cold and shaky. Got on my flight, landed in Detroit, where I'm still really cold and shaky. Wandered around the airport looking for some hot cocoa and just not feeling very good. And people in the hospital started looking at me with concern, saying, you don't look good. And when people just walk up to you randomly and tell you, you don't look good, either they're being very mean to you <laughs> or there is something seriously wrong. And they offered to have me go to the hospital via ambulance. I said, no, I'm okay. But then a couple more people came up later while I was still on that same layover and said, you don't look good. So I finally went to the counter and I looked for a ticket agent and had them call me emergency medical services where I was taken to the closest hospital to where I was. And as I sat in that um, emergency room, um, waiting and waiting to be seen because they thought I just had the flu. Because meningitis, when it starts, it doesn't look like the pictures that you saw. People feel like they have the flu and they just sit there. 
and you're kind of low priority in the ER, especially the ER I was in. There was a young guy right across the hall from me, about 18 years old, sitting there with a gunshot wound. And he looked at me and asked me if I was okay. So I must have been in really bad shape for him to notice. And I ended up waiting about four hours. And my wife at the time, she um, was waiting for me at the airport. And this is 2005, we didn't have cell phones. This is back in the Stone Age compared to now. So I had to have her caged at the airport. Now imagine driving around the airport, waiting and waiting, then having to park the car and come into the airport to try and figure out what's going on. And you hear your name come over the intercom. My wife came to the phone in tears to talk to me. And I said, I'm in the hospital. They don't know what's wrong. They think it's the flu. They're gonna give me an IV and then they're gonna put me on the next flight home. And I told my wife I loved her, hung up the phone. 20 minutes later, the nurse comes in, the nurse that had been trying to take care of me this whole time. And I said, look, I've got school tomorrow. I need you to treat me or let me go. And the nurse looked at me right in the eyes and said, if you leave now, you'll probably die. And she left to go take care of some other patients. And I started crying and I cried myself to sleep. And I didn't wake up for the next nine days. I was in a horrible coma that played on all my worst fears, these coma dreams. Now, when we dream, you know, our dreams are weird in general, but add into that all the painkillers and medications and things like that that they're trying to, to save your life with, and your dreams become just horrible nightmares and realities for you. And it played on all of my worst fears. And while all this is going on, my family finally arrives. It takes three days for them to get there from Colorado and Utah. There were just no flights out. My family, scared to death, jumps in the car and drives to the, to the nearest airport where they can get a flight. And they still can't get that flight until the next day. So on day three, my family shows up. And the doctors on that first night when they called my wife told her I had a less than 3% chance of living. They did not think I was gonna pull through that night. But three days later, my family arrives and they said, well, he's not dead, but he's in a coma and he's never going to come out of that coma. And if he does, his life isn't going to be worth living. And the reason they said that is that my heart was beating at 190 beats per minute and my brain was functioning at less than 2% of what we normally function at. So for my family, who the last time they saw me, saw me happy, healthy, I was 24, I was a swing dance instructor, I was hiking, I was in college getting ready to take my first backpacking trip through, um, through Yellow, um, Yellowstone, I was getting ready to become a national park ranger, doing all these things that people my age should be doing. And then the next time they see me, I'm in bed with bandages and tubes attached to me with a ventilator tube shoved down my throat. My nose, one of the few visible things my family could see, had turned black. My fingers and my legs were turned black. I had that blanching or non-blanching rash that you can see in those pictures all over my body. And it's a shock to them. My mother didn't know what to do. She, she saw the little beard that I had grown. She thought that was part of it too and it scared her even more. Um, and they had to explain to her that was fine. Um, eventually they would shave that off to try and make everything look a little bit more normal, but there was no normal for me. I was in that coma for nine days. And they took the ventilator tube out um, on my mother's birthday, which was April 17th. I went to the coma on April 3rd, came out on, on the 12th. And they pulled that tube out, I got like this for weeks couldn't understand what was being said. And my memory wasn't the same as it was. I would have conversations with somebody and then I couldn't remember that I had that conversation. The hospital was nice enough to find a, a room for my family to stay in and if one of my family members left, I would think that they'd be gone for hours even if they were only gone for 20, 30 minutes and I would break down hoping, you know, wanting to see them again. Because I didn't think I would get to. 
the, the type of person I am is I didn't want to show weakness for myself. I always put other people first instead of myself. And so seeing that my family was scared, I thought I had to put on a brave face for them. And, you know, so this was nothing. But in doing that, I didn't allow myself to mourn all the things that were going on in my body. I didn't allow myself to be in as much pain as I should have been um, and to, to understand what was going on with me. I wanted to get better for them and move on with my life. But what most people don't realize about meningitis is it's also a brain injury. It affects the meninges in your brain. It's, it's very small. The bacteria that gets to the blood brain barrier and gets in the, into there. So it, it affects you no matter what, not just the physical, but there's lots of depression and sadness and grief that go along with this. Your whole life changes and mine did in an instant. You know, everything that I worked for, the music that I played, the dancing that I did, the, the hiking, the outdoor life, all of that was suddenly just ripped away from me. You know, they, the doctors would come in every day to tell me what part of my body I was gonna lose. First, it was some toes and then my foot, some fingers, eventually my left leg. And at one point, the doctors thought that I would never walk again. But I'm stubborn. I didn't let that happen. So after over a month in the hospital in Detroit, I was finally flown back to Utah to recover close to home and then have the amputations done. So in the end, after all of that, they ended up amputating my left leg below the knee, all the toes on my right foot, two fingers on my left hand, parts of three on my right. I have severe contractures in both hands, nerve damage in both hands, legs, and feet. That is constant. On the one to 10 scale, I'm at a, a constant five every day, which is no fun for anybody. I also went deaf in my left ear, which I didn't discover for almost a month after because my body was in so much shock from everything that was going on that I didn't, I didn't even have time to notice my hearing until I was in the hospital and I was like, what's going on? I can't hear what's going, going on in this ear. And my mother tried whispering in that ear to see if I could hear it. There was nothing. So I lost the pitch that I had to be able to sing. And I also lost the function of my kidneys and had to go on dialysis, which is the worst experience through all of that, worse than the amputations. When the kidneys shut down, you're attached to a machine for three to four hours a day, and you can't do anything. You can't travel without having to find another place for dialysis. It was an awful experience. And after a year and a half, I, I finally got a, a kidney transplant for that. And that's just one of the over 30 surgeries I have had since 2005, pretty much all related to the meningitis. I've had amputations, I've had revision amputations, I've had, had nerve surgery, vascular surgery, so many things that have all spun off of this one disease. But on top of that, the emotional damage has been horrific. I, I was in a severe shock and depression over it all that I was in denial about it. It had effects on my relationships with everybody, but I was too blind to see what, was, what my actions were having on people. I was angry for a long, long time. And all of this had an effect on my relationships with people. And it affected my marriage. And I, again, I was too blind to see what was happening. I became selfish and eventually it affected my marriage to the point that we ended up getting divorced. You know, I isolated myself and my family, especially after my mother died, uh, because I didn't feel like anybody really cared. And it, it was a long recovery. It was a very long recovery. It took four years for me to be able to get back to walking full time. I had so many surgeries to make that happen. Um, lots of 
appointments with pros or prostheticians to be able to get new legs that would work. I have no toes on my right foot, so for years and years it took, it, it was just in pain trying to be able to walk, but I pushed through it because I wanted to live my life as close to normal as possible. You know, it's been 17 years and I still go through pain every day. I still have my moments where I feel horrifically sad about all of this. There were times when I didn't have the best care from some doctor teams and sometimes I had amazing care from doctor teams. It just depended on where I was and you know how invested some of those doctors were in my recovery and me as a person. You know, and fortunately, I've been lucky enough over the last several years to find great doctors who are invested in my recovery and have helped me get back to where I wanted to be in life. But there is still the pain and the memory and the ongoing nature of what meningitis is. It doesn't just go away. 10 or 10 to 15% of people die from this. Another 20, 25% of people are affected or they say are affected for the rest of their life due to, you know, amputations like I've had. But 100% of those people are affected, not just from the amputations or the pain or the mental health. There's financial repercussions to all of this. The doctor bills are expensive and it's ongoing. It doesn't just stop. And so I, I try to travel around and share my story with people to help them understand why we need to vaccinated against this disease. It seems like it's rare, and some people might think that it's not worth vaccinating against because it only happens to a handful of people. But if it's you, it's not rare. If it's your family and they see what happens to you, it's horrific to them, it's scary, it's terrifying. Your friends, they don't know what to do with it either. You know, imagine it's you. Imagine it's your child who one day is running around playing with their friends out on the playground, and the next day they're in a hospital clinging to life or, they, or passing away, or if they do survive, they end up missing their leg. Think about the impact on their life. I was 24 years old. My life was just starting, and it, everything changed. And I don't want that for anybody else. Thank you, Nate, for sharing that with us. Um, I have a lot of people that come with, to me with a lot of different excuses about why they're, they're vaccine hesitant. You mentioned one of them, that this disease is rare. Um, you know, we talked about it, it being kind of an unpredictable thing. Did you even know what meningitis was or Neisseria meningitis when you got sick? I didn't actually, no. Um, I think my mom knew about meningitis because when I was young and I would get sick, she would always have me try to touch my chin to my chest to make sure that my neck wasn't stiff. But that's the extent I knew about it. I didn't know what that was. A lot of people I meet, you know, feel like their kids are really healthy. They they raise them in a healthy environment. They, you know, especially through COVID and whatnot, you know, that's become something parents have become more aware of. Um, and therefore, my kids, you know, not going to get this. They've got a they've got a good immune system and they're healthy. What was your health like before you got sick from all of this? I was very healthy. Um, again, I was an outdoorsy guy. I taught swing dancing. I played music. I, I played water polo in college. There was a lot of things going on where I, I, I was in very good condition. But just because I'm in good health doesn't mean that the person across the hall from me isn't a carrier for this. And the thing about young, younger people is as they're coming up, you know, they're growing up, they haven't been as exposed to this as older people have, you know, so that their bodies haven't had a chance to fight this off, which is why when they get into these areas like junior high, all the way up to college, and they start kissing and sharing drinks, and, you know, all their mouths are touching the same thing that another kid's mouth is touched, that's how it spreads. And they haven't developed that immune system yet. They're just getting into that area where they can. So their bodies haven't built up what they need to be able to fight off that disease. It's, yeah, it's like old people in nursing homes during COVID. They've never been exposed to it before. 
And so their bodies couldn't fight it off. And that's why we saw people in the nursing homes start passing away um, right at the start of the pandemic. You know, we didn't talk about this illness. So it's it's really prominent in teens and then people in their early 20s. Um, and it is spread by activities you see more in teenagers. So sharing drinks, um, you know, eating after each other, anything where you might exchange saliva, coughing, sneezing, you know, not protecting that well, kissing, those type of activities, which we all know that that time of life is kind of a, a, a peak time for more social interaction. So it does allow for the optimal spread at the time when it's it's most prevalent. Um, when did you first find out that there was a vaccine for this? And, and what did you think about that? I mean, knowing what you had been through, what were, what were your thoughts? Well, back in 2005, they did not have a, a vaccine for what I had. Um, so I didn't find out about, the vac- or about this vaccine until just a few years ago, actually. Um, so I didn't have the opportunity to get vaccinated against it. If I did, I would have, I would have gotten it because I get all of my vaccines and I haven't had any of those diseases that I've been vaccinated against. Um, but knowing that there's a vaccine out there, I wanted to get out and share my story and help illustrate why you want vaccinations. Because I don't want anybody to have to go through what I did. You know, it's, it's a stark change from being a perfectly healthy person being bound to a wheelchair for at least four years and then off and on since then. I mean, I've been lucky enough to be able to get up and walk full time over the last several years and never use the wheelchair, but not everybody's as lucky as I am. Yeah. Well, I, I know as a mom, I mean, I've got four teenagers myself and two of them have gotten old enough to be fully vaccinated. Um, but it's, I mean, it's constantly one of my fears, you know, if, if anybody were to ask me, is it for something were to happen to them? And I guess it's that I work in medicine and I do see these things from time to time. Um, so I would certainly encourage uh, parents to vaccinate their kids. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask one more follow-up question and see if our audience has anything that they would like to add. But you only spoke a little bit um, after your talk in the middle of the day today. You know, you talk about being 17 years out. You're not done with this journey yet, are you? I mean, you've got some more surgeries coming up. Yeah, I've got some other surgeries that'll be coming up. Um, I've had over 30 surgeries since 2005 um, related to amputations and kidneys and deafness in my ear. They talked about doing a cochlear implant, which I, you know, for some people it's great. For me, I just don't want to have another surgery, especially on my head especially one that could cause it or that could bring on more meningitis right. um, because of the, the foreign body being there. The yeah. foreign body being there. Okay. Um, but yeah, I have no immune system from the, my kidney transplant. So I do pick up random viruses regularly. I'm in the hospital three to four times a year on average. Um, so it, it's, you're never done with this journey. All right, well, I'd like to open this up. We have a question. Um, yes, what's your question? Um, so my son, before he went to college a few years ago, he had the meningitis vaccine, but there wasn't the two and the second shot. So he's 23 now. Is it too late to get the vaccine or what ages are optimal for getting the vaccine? So he's right at the top end of the range. Um, I would recommend that he meet with his primary care provider and see about getting vaccinated. Um, as you noticed um, on the peak of the curve, um, it starts to come down about the age group, but we do continue to vaccinate people later into life for different reasons. So a lot of it depends on what his exposures are, if he's still living in that really that environment where he's around a lot of people or maybe his job takes him there, other health reasons. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm vaccinating a gentleman right now in the clinic that's 82 that's about to have a cochlear implant. So the back, we typically try to focus this vaccine between that 16 to 23 year old group, but that's not a strict parameter. There's a lot of reasons when we might give it at different points in time in life. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, so being multiple years out from most of your amputation surgeries, I presume. Uh, do you still end up feeling like phantom pains uh, in some areas or has that gone away? So I had phantom pains for about two months after the hospital or after, after the amputations. Um, but I've, I've been fortunate that I haven't had them since. I know some people struggle with ongoing phantom limb syndrome 
Um, and it's, it's not a fun thing to feel. I do have constant nerve pain in those areas and I've had revision surgeries where they've done some work to try to remove um, neuromas from the bottom of my leg where the nerve had grown into a, a bundle about as thick as my thumb and about that long, all wrapped up in the bottom of my leg that I had to try and walk on for years. Um, and so they've gone in and they've actually reopened up the place where they amputated my leg, snipped the nerve and buried it into a muscle. It's not a pleasant experience, but uh, it helped out a lot after having that done to be able to walk more comfortably. Any other questions from our audience tonight? Okay. Well, Nate, I did want to thank you for sharing your story thank and you. being here tonight. Um, to all of you in the Grand River community, um, thank you for participating and listening to our vaccination program. We are excited to continue to work with the Vaccine Coalition with the Health Department and get the word out and try and get more and more of our kids vaccinated to prevent these diseases. We'll be here to support you no matter what. I encourage you to have that discussion with your primary care provider if you'd like to know more. Thank you and have a good night.